brother's way. Sure. Yeah. He came over to borrow a lighter, and I said, "What are you doing, trying to set the fire alarm?" <laughs> 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 he goes, "I'm lighting some candles." He goes, "I hope you don't set it off." It's like what? Like singular. <laughs> Chris, you're going to be in action item number one. Oh, okay. So there's a thing. Yeah. Okay, sorry. You're going to get you out of here. Two colleagues Happy like birthday, us. <laughs> no, it's not my birthday. You have to be the last day of Scott. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little surprise. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it goes all week. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it starts from the first through seven. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we live? We are. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We ask you to please rise for the opening prayer and pledge allegiance before we commence our meeting. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of life and acknowledge our dependence upon you. Lord, we pray this morning for our residents in Lairdsville. Last Thursday, it was described as the sound of a freight train ripped through their tiny village. This tornado left a path of destruction that disregarded years of hard work. We thank you for your mercy that no one was killed or injured. We witnessed your love and kindness in the neighbors from all over that rendered your assistance to help those that had roofs torn off and windows blown out. The destruction is incredible, and we see in a blink of an eye how life can be changed. But we also see the goodness in man helping each other. We pray you'll provide relief and aid to this community. Father, today we're honoring our public safety telecommunicators. During an emergency, these are the lines of communication that sends the assistance to the public. We thank you for their lives, as they are the ones that are the vital link to monitor our law enforcement, firefighters, and EMS on critical and often dangerous calls. They are the voices that we cry out to first in an emergency, and are the one with the calm and steady voice that stays with us until help arrives. Lord, their work is very stressful. And we ask that you'll comfort them with a sense of relief and peace after each shift. Lord, we continue our prayers for the people of Ukraine. We hear and see 
the over four million refugees that have been forced to flee. <coughs> we hear and see of the bodies with their hands tied behind their backs and being shot in the back of the head. Women being raped in front of their children. Homes looted and destroyed. We hear and see of the atrocities and pure evil. And Lord, we pre ask for an end to these horrors. May your peace and comfort help those that are suffering anguish and fear. We pray these things humbly in your name. Amen. 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 Good morning. At this time, we'll convene the Commissioner's public meeting and ask for approval on the minutes of the previous meeting. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All here to aye. 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 So carried. And at this time, I'll have a comment on the agenda, agenda items only. Okay, hearing none. We have some proclamations this morning. First would be for the Pennsylvania 811 Safe Digging Month. Okay. Mr. Sir. Whereas the month of April 2022 recognized as Pennsylvania 811 Safe Digging Month and the initiative sponsored by the Pennsylvania 811, a utility notification information center celebrating its 50th year of continuous service in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Whereas Pennsylvania 811 received close to 1,050,000 excavation notifications in the year 2021 and tr transmitted approximately 6.7 million notifications to their member facility owners and operators, allowing essential utility and construction crews to provide vital underground services and repair of critical infrastructure to the communities throughout Pennsylvania. And whereas when dialing 811, at least three business days before digging, a homeowner or a contractor is connected to a unique service that notifies the appropriate underground utility operators in the municipality in which the work will be performed. And whereas, by notifying 811 of their intent to dig, the homeowner or contractor is knowingly helping to protect the underground utilities, themselves, the work crews, and their neighbors from any unsafe digging practices within their communities. Whereas upon receiving the notification from Pennsylvania 811, the facility owners and operators dispersed to the said work site to mark the approximate location of their underground utilities with uh, flags, paint, or both to establish an 18-inch tolerance zone of the outside wall or edge of their line of facility. And now, therefore, be it resolved that the County of Lycoming Pennsylvania, in support of the Pennsylvania Underground Utility Line Protection Law, PA Act 287 of 1974, as amended, we do hereby proclaim April 2022 as Pennsylvania's 811 Safe Digging Month and encourage all Pennsylvanians to visit the Pennsylvania 811 website at PA www.pa1call.org for information about digging safely. I don't believe there are any representatives here, but I can tell you uh, how important this is uh, being in the construction field. And we, mm -hmm. we made a mistake ourselves when we were doing a, a job, not that we did it intentionally, but we had called them out and there was somebody that put a line in that never notified any utilities. And when we dug alongside the house and there was a, a trench, we hit one of the water lines and you know, it comes out very quick <laughs> and we didn't know exactly what to do and when we called for help they said well you guys must be rookies digging just crimp the the copper it will bend easily you know and it stopped the water at least for them but it could have easily been a gas line so when you're doing work outside in your own properties you know and you're digging a trench to to go out to a garage that you're going to put up let the utility companies know it because inevitably somebody's going to come around and dig that land up sooner or later and can cause serious harm. So, you know. That's a good point. You want to think about 50 years of continuous service and at the same time, um, it's easy to make the call and have them drop check things because just for the safety of your family and your neighbors, because we, we don't want to ever have a tragedy happen in our county uh, when it could be averted with a simple phone call and they're glad to come out and check. 
uh, and I'll be glad to tell you exactly where you stay away from. And I think it's the law, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's. It I think we have a legal obligation to do that also. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, I'd say, speaking from experience, um, you should call eight one one each for each project that you're doing. Don't just rely on your memory of, of the last time you, you dug, um, because if you don't have a call that's current um, and you hit something, then it's on you. Right. That's a good point. <coughs> Okay, next proclamation would be um, National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. And, uh, from April 10th through April 16th, it's National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time, they require police, fire, or emergency medical services. Whereas when an emergency occurs, the prompt response of police, firefighters, and EMS personnel is critical to the protection of life and preservation of property. Whereas the safety of our emergency service providers is dependent upon the quality and accuracy of information obtained from citizens who telephone the Lycoming County Communications Center and the Pennsylvania State Police and tours of barracks, whereas public safety telecommunicators are the first and most critical contact our citizens have with their emergency services, whereas public safety telecommunicators are the single vital link for our emergency services providers by monitoring their activities by radio providing them information and ensuring their safety. And whereas public safety telecommunicators in Lycoming County have contributed substantially to the apprehension of criminals, suppression of fires, and treatment of patients. And whereas telecommunicators exhibit compassion, understanding, professionalism during the performance of their job in the past year. Therefore, be resolved that the Lycoming County Commissioners Clear the week of April 10th through April 16th, 2022, to be the National Telecommunications Week in Lycoming County in honor of men and women whose diligence and professionalism keep our county and citizens safe. Signed this seventh day of April, 2022, Lycoming County Commissioners Scott Mesker, Chairman, Tony Armasar, Vice Chairman, and Richard Mirabito, Secretary. And Beth from EMS, would you like to come up and sure. tell us if few great things that have happened, especially in the last year, and all the hard work of your staff. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. I'm Beth, the Communications Manager. Um, I want to read a poem here, Author Unknown. It's called, Who Am I? And it just tells you, this speaks mostly of the, the calls that they, the type of calls that they handle. Um, I'm the voice that calms the mother, breathing life into her infant son. I am the invisible hand that holds and comforts the elderly man who woke up and found his wife of 50 years had passed away during the night. I am the friend who talks the disgruntled teenager out of ending their own life. I sent help, I sent help when you had your first automobile accident. I am the one who tries to obtain the information from callers to ensure that the scene is safe for those I dispatch to emergencies, all the while anticipating the worst and hoping for the best. I am the psychologist who readily adapts my language and my tone of voice to serve the needs of my callers with compassion and understanding. I am the ears that listen to the needs of all those I serve. I have heard the screams of faceless people that I will never forget. I have cried at the atrocities of mankind and rejoiced at the miracle of life. I was there, though unseen, by my comrades in the field during the most trying emergencies. I have tried to visualize the scene to coincide with the voices I have heard. I am usually not privy to the outcome of the call, and so I wonder. I am the one who works weekends, strange shifts, and holidays. Children do not say they want my job when they grow up, yet I am this vocation by choice. Those I help do not call back to say thank you. Still, there is comfort in the challenge, integrity, and the purpose of my employment. I am thankful to provide such a meaningful service. I am a mother, father, sister, brother, son, or daughter. I am here when you need me and still here when you don't. My office is never empty and the work here is never done. I am always on call. The training is strenuous, demanding, and endless. No two days of work are ever the same. Who am I? 
I am an emergency dispatcher, and I am proud. That pretty much covers what our folks do. And there's a specific point um, that I want to make on this. We, next week is the APCO, which is um, Association of Public Safety Communications Officers. And it is a conference that is occurring in Lancaster, Pennsylvania next week. And I am going to toot the horn of one of our telecommunicators. He is um, being given the award for telecommunicator of the year for the state for assisting with um, delivery of twins at 26 weeks um, during the, the snowstorm that we had in January. And it was in Sullivan County. Um, not only did he assist in delivering twins at 26 weeks, it was the mother herself he assisted and the first baby was born in the amniotic sac. He had to assist her in breaking the sac and getting the baby born. And the second baby was born breech, and he also had to assist her through that, um, warming them, making sure that they're breathing okay um, in the 26, 27 minutes it took the ambulance to get on the scene. So Clint Frackman is one of our telecommunicators. Um, four, four years maybe, Clint has on three or four years. Um, we were very fortunate to have him on the midnight shift and she was very fortunate to, to have him answer the phone the night that she called. And we're very proud of him for winning Telecommunicator of the Year um, for APCO for this year. So he'll be presented with that award in Lancaster um, next week at the APCO conference. Um, our current... I wish he could have been here, but he worked the midnight shift last night and wanted to go home and go to bed. So. Unbelievable. <laughs> He's, he is not a man who likes recognition. If you've ever met Clint, he's a very quiet, peaceful, doesn't like to be recognized person. So I'm not surprised that he wouldn't come. When they get a chance to sleep, they want to sleep. <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, we currently have 12 on staff, 12 911 telecommunicators that range in years of service from one year to 13 years. And I'm going to name them because I feel like they should be named this week. Stephanie Andrus, Jacob Winter, and Ashley Dietrich. Those are our three supervisors. Timothy Bausch, Mark Miller, Samantha Gordner, Tyler Fetterman, Clinton Frackman, Igeisha Brown, Alex Hafner, Brenton Flieger, and Katie DeSanto. Those are our 12 full-time 911 telecommunicators. We also have Logan Lidecker, who is our communications uh, training coordinator, and Dustin Williams, who is our CAD coordinator, who help out continuously <coughs> in the 911 center. And we also have Shirley Ham, who is our administrative assistant, who does a ton of things for all of us, and Tyler Landis, who's back there, and Garrett McKinney, who is our, um, they are our GIS folks, who they assist with all of our mapping for the county and things and direct support of the 911 system. Uh, Barry Hutchins also, who's still part-time with us, but he's not here today either. Um, I can't say anything but wonderful things about these people. They're a wonderfully dedicated bunch. Um, for an example, and we've been working short-staffed as everybody else has forever, uh, telecommunicators are very hard to find now. They're a very unique bunch of people. When I came into this job 22 years ago, you had to fight to get a position. The world has changed. It's not that way anymore. It's the same way 20 years ago as a police officer. You had to fight to get a position as a police officer. That doesn't happen anymore either. Um, in 2021, this group covered 5,553 and a half hours of overtime. Um, using 73 and a half hours of unscheduled leave for the year of 2021. Uh, that means out of all those people, out of an entire year of 24 seven, they use 73 and a half hours that they called off sick, which is completely amazing to me. <coughs> uh, the first quarter of this year, 2022, they've already covered 1,165 hours of overtime. 45 hours of unscheduled leave and 28 of that was one employee who had COVID and who was very sick and was off for over a week. Um, dedication is something that I can't say enough about these people. They come to work. Um, if it's storming, they come in. If the pager goes off, they come in. They, d they, don't, they don't ever stop. They never say it's not my problem. They're always there. And the citizens of Lycoming and Sullivan counties are blessed to have such a dedicated, caring bunch of individuals on their 911 team, and so am I as their manager. Hutch, you want to say anything? Oh, God, God covered it. I can't. <laughs> Thank you. You know, 911, we have to make sure the phones are answered. They're there when we get hurt. I can think back seven years ago when I was um, stupid enough 
to not make sure that the position I was on a ladder was the right position and fell off a ladder, broke bone in my back, broke my foot, uh, my finger, and the thud hit, the, I, I hit the ground so hard in August, it was in August window, people had the windows open, I hit the ground so hard that two of my neighbors heard the thud and they come out to hear what was going on and saw me laying in the yard. And uh, my one neighbor came over and looked at me, ended up seeing my hand the way it was and physically got sick and went over and called 911. And the first person I saw was Hutch. Uh, I see Hutch every day. And then they're so glad to see him in my life. <laughs> and uh, that's just that's one minor, minor emergency. You know, you hear of heart attacks, you hear of strokes, people living out in rural areas, which I don't. And what Clint did was amazing. And to keep that father calm, which was a challenge, let alone help deliver two babies, um, you know, it, 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 he deserves that award. Um, so we are very thankful and blessed to have the, the staff we have and the dedication, you know, to, to have that limited number of hours that they call in sick. They're there. Um, they truly care about people in this community and what they're doing. And uh, we thank them for their dedication. And we're blessed to have them in our county. We thank you for what you do. I think it's worth restating that we are very grateful. Um, you know, when you talk about 73 hours on scheduled and being so tight with uh, and understaffed, it was amazing. I do want to add that, you know, there are uh, everyone's positions here in the county are very important, but there are some, and even our our positions are sometimes very stressful. But when you take a look at um, what our operators, 911 operators and telecommunicators do, and, uh, and now there's going to be cameras coming on board, uh, and they're going to be able to see the scene and, and be right in the midst of the action. Um, we're concerned about that, very concerned. Um, it's it's kind of like when you, you look at the coroner's office and some of the scenes that they go out to, I don't, I don't know how they do it. It's it's really unbelievable, and uh, the psychological damage it has to occur. It, it has to occur over their lifetime. It's difficult. So, um, and we can't say enough about our telecommunicators and our and our deputy coordinators. And uh, again, we're, we're blessed and grateful that uh, you're with Lincoln County. You know, Beth, I, I thought that was an absolutely great poem to describe uh, what what they do, what the telecommunicators do. And I was struck by one line in particular, challenge, integrity, and purpose of vocation. And that is a powerful message about purpose of vocation, about why folks come in every day when they're not feeling well, why they respond, why they work all the hours that they do. And I hope that the public will... If you know it, telecommunicator, say thanks to them. Uh, if you don't know, and you happen to call 911, say thanks. And I guess the point that you're telling us when you say that uh, it's hard to find people is that we can't take them for granted. And so we certainly don't, and that's why we do this proclamation this year, uh, today, and we do it every year, because we want the public to understand. And, I thank you for sharing the poem with us. I think this is the first year you may have done that. Uh, but I think it says it all. And to Clint, you know, well-deserved statewide award, something that we as a community should be proud of, that from a community of 113,000 people and 13 on staff or so emerges the person who takes the state award for that position. And that says a lot about him as a person and his integrity and his challenges and his purpose of vacation of vocation so thank you to clint and congratulations to him and to all the staff yeah. and beth on behalf of the, of the of the law enforcement people and the other ems workers the firefighters that are on the calls i was out on those calls for 30 years and the radio system that invested a great deal in is vital 
I have been in parts of this county that takes, you're in the back hills. That is your lifeline, that, that radio, once you get out of that car, you have your partner and you have that portable. And God forbid if something breaks out, that portable is your lifeline to get you the help that you need. We saw it happen with um, a trooper that was fired upon, there were marshals that were fired upon in our sheriff's office where they couldn't get the service they needed. And one of the marshals had to run down the road a half a mile until she got service to call in the shooting. And so it's vital that those radios work because they are the lifelines. That's, so everybody goes home at night safely. And there was times where we were out of calls. I was, I was worried because we didn't know whether that portable was gonna work in that area because it was so rural. And thank God it did. So thank you on behalf of those individuals as I experienced that for 30 years, making sure that you were on the other end and your staff was on the other end to answer us. And always check on us because there was times we get, you know, the status checks are so important make sure that we're safe. We'd like, to, we'd like to get a photo with you and your staff if you come up, please. Okay, today uh, we begin a series. Last year what we did was we had uh, a series where we had uh, county departments that would come and explain um, what each department did for the county. It was warmly received by the public as uh, they heard what each, each department did for the, for the residents of the county. And so we wanted to continue the series this year with nonprofits. Well, what nonprofits do for you and uh, we're going to kick off the series starting today and each week we'll have a nonprofit uh, speak for five or ten minutes preferably ten minutes because each one's extremely important ten minutes isn't enough for what they do but today we're honored to have uh, Dwayne Hirschberger from Habitat for Humanity here to kick off our series and um, we're glad and excited that you're here Dwayne thank you for Commissioner Metzger and um, Masari and Mirabito and Mr. McDermott, thank you so much for this opportunity to share about what Habitat um, is about. I have collected a drawer full of clothes that have the Habitat logo on them from my years of work with Habitat for Humanity, really since 1989. And when I'm out and about and people see what I'm wearing, they say, what's Habitat for Humanity about? And I'm going to share a word that I use in just a few moments, but I want to tell you about somebody named Jesse Williams who lived in a shack in rural South Georgia and was actually a work colleague of mine in the years that I worked with Habitat for Humanity International um, in this uh, Georgia office. Jesse lived in a shack and caring for her disabled son and partially disabled husband. And uh, during the 1980s, in the very early years of Habitat for Humanity, she, uh, she, she owned a house. A Habitat for Humanity house was built for her. And I watched the transformation in her life as she lived and took care of her family in that setting. And I was so privileged one day to go to the mortgage burning ceremony where um, after 30 years she had paid off, actually owned about 20 years in her case, had paid off the mortgage for her house and owned it free and clear. That was an inspiring day. I think of a homeowner in Gab named Gabriella in Honduras that my family had an opportunity to meet in 2004 when we took our three teenage kids 
to Honduras on a habitat trip. They would look back on that and say that it was the best vacation they ever had in their lives, even though we worked hard every day during the work week that we were there. That experience never left them, and our middle daughter went on and became a nurse, and later a nurse practitioner, and became fluent in Spanish, and now works in a clinic in South Philadelphia where she uses her Spanish daily. It was a transformative experience for her. I think of Robin Lovell in this community, who I've never met, and is a homeowner in Williamsport, who will join us at April 26th at a special event that we have here in town at the Community Arts Center. Um, and the commissioners and Matt are all invited to attend that. Um, and she will share her experience as a Habitat homeowner in this community for 15 years. The early years of Habitat, there were only a few homeowners. We were a small organization and growing in the 1980s and 90s. Wasn't until the mid, early 1990s and into 2000 that it really took off. We're beginning to see the long-term effects of a family that lived in a, sh I'm calling it a shack, substandard housing. Lived in substandard housing and then moved to a, a simple, decent, affordable home that they own we're only beginning to see the effects of the, uh, of the third generation of that. We've seen the second generation for a little while. And we're seeing kids that go to college. We're seeing kids that have careers and are entering middle class. Um, a few years ago, Clemson University was in the National Football Championship. Two of their starters grew up in Habitat for Humanity homes in Greenville, South Carolina. They will not have a need for Habitat for Humanity homes. I'm looking forward to the day when we work our way out of a job. So the word that I use when people ask me of what Habitat is about is the word transformation. It's not just transformative for homeowners, uh, thousands and thousands of homeowners around the world, but transformative for people who get involved. I think of a, a friend of mine who passed away a few years ago named Jim Tierney, who worked on Wall Street for his entire career and retired in northern New Jersey and started volunteering at Newark Habitat for Humanity at a time when that affiliate was experiencing a lot of difficulty. He started volunteering on the work site, showed up, kept showing up, and eventually became executive director of the Newark Habitat for Humanity and helped them through some real crisis, financial and other crises that they were having and I learned later, I knew at the time he was working as an unpaid full-time executive director. I found out later that he had actually contributed several hundred thousand of his own dollars to help Habitat recover and grow. And one of his colleagues, Russ, who told me in one of my visits there in my role with Habitat for Humanity, said the city council member of Newark had told Russ that Habitat's the only organization that comes into the city brings resources in and doesn't take anything out, just because of the nature of what we do. I think of my friend Dick Reed, who's now 90 years old, who had the same story, led a very successful engineering company in central New Jersey for a lot of years, retired and thought he was gonna play golf and just enjoy retirement. He showed up for golf a number of times, got a little bored, so one day he just showed up at the Habitat for Humanity work site over in Tom's River and eventually his golfing buddies just didn't see anything of him anymore after that. As a retired engineer, he led the construction for the really small time construction that they were doing. But when Hurricane Sandy hit, that affiliate shifted from doing about one house every 12 to 18 months and a few home repairs to in the space of three years, they did major repairs to over 60 homes that were damaged by Hurricane Sandy under Dick Reed's leadership. He's also traveled with me to Guatemala a couple of times, and a, a few months ago he was moving and cleaning out his stuff, and he sent me a, a $100 Quetzale bill, which is about $8 of American money, and said, Dwayne, I can't go to Guatemala anymore. Next time you go, go have a cold one on me. So I look forward to that time. I think of Julie, who went with me on another Habitat for Humanity trip. I didn't know it at the time, but she had tried suicide a couple of times. She just graduated from college and was entering the workforce and was gay and had not come out to family and friends and was dealing with all of this inner stuff. 
On that Habitat for Humanity trip, something inside her awakened, and she decided to go home and come out to her friends and family. And after a turmoil of a year or two, and people in, that, in her family community becoming accustomed to this news, um, she started thriving and now works at a, at a recruiting company in Texas. And I still stay in touch with her family and they talk about how powerful a transformative experience that was for them. Our roots are really in the uh, story of Mildred and Linda Fuller, who uh, Mildred as a very entrepreneurial, ambitious young man with um, uh, ambitions to be a millionaire by the time he was 30 and reached that goal several times over but whose family and marriage was falling apart. He and Linda decided to um, give away all of their money. I said they decided to give away all their money, and they did, and, re and decided that they would also dedicate their lives to God. They were not church people, and they didn't become big church people. They just knew that there was something bigger going on that was there for them. And it was from that transformative experience in their lives that about seven or eight years later, they uh, founded Habitat for Humanity and it grew into what it is today. Locally, Habitat for Humanity has built 41 homes in this community, uh, most of them in Williamsport, a few of them in some of the outlying areas. I think of Ben and Ruth Keller. Ben's no longer with us and Ruth um, is, but she's actually in the process of moving to Florida to join her daughter, so we will miss her. Ben and Ruth were some of the founders of Habitat for Humanity here in the Williamsport area. There's also a name that I've run across that's familiar, familiar to me, Hirschberger, in that Joyce and I forget her husband's name, Hirschberger, but, but exactly. I've never met them, and people ask me all the time if we're related. As far as I know, we're not. Uh, but they also were instrumental in helping to found Habitat here in the Williamsport area in the 1980s and um, secure housing for 41 families eventually in this community. Habitat homeowners pay taxes. Um, I did a calculation a few weeks ago and, and the homeowners in just in the city of Williamsport pay over $100,000 a year in property taxes. They pay, pay taxes based on the property tax assessment that everybody else uh, pays for. We have a small staff. There's only three of us that are, um, two of us that are full-time, three of us that are full-time, and one person who works about half-time for us and splits time with the Restore in our finance and accounting. Then we have some other Restore staff at our 335 Rose Street location. Um, just a word about that, we received a large donation of cabinets from Woodmode Inc., the company that went out of business and now is being revived again, is liquidating a bunch of their cabinets. When I say large, I mean 25 tractor trailer loads of brand new cabinets. Most of them uh, either full or partial sets, and we're selling them out at the old Don Patron's restaurant in, um, on East 3rd Street as well as a few in our restore here in town. My own story is that I worked with International for a lot of Habitat International for many years. Came to Williamsport uh, last June thinking I was only going to be here for six, in, six or nine months as an interim executive director because I'm sort of semi-retired semi in my other life. But in getting to know our board of directors, getting to know our staff, getting to know the local people who are so supportive of Habitat, I thought I can't just set us up to build a couple of houses in Williamsport, some houses in Southside. We're starting a home preservation project that actually just rolling out this week. We're getting all this stuff going. Um, I can't just set this up and then let somebody else have all the fun. So I've talked with our board of directors and I plan to stay around for another five or six years until I, I'm going to try fully retiring again, although I don't know how well that's going to go. I want to wrap this up with one more story. Viola Lauzo. If you do any research, you will discover that she was born in Pennsylvania in the mid-1920s, moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee as a child and grew up wound up living in Detroit, Michigan, became very active in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and went to southern Alabama to help with voting registration. 
and wound up actually working in the planning and logistics for the second Selma march from Selma to Birmingham march that where Martin Luther King was leading that was actually successful. The first one you may recall they got beaten back by Bull O'Connor's dogs and, um, and the sheriff's department that was working there at the time. The second one was successful. She was planning logistics for that and one night in 1965 I believe she was driving um, three black men back to the airport as a white woman. They, they stopped at a, a gas station to fill up with gas. A car, car pulled up beside him with three known Ku Klux Klan members and one person who the, the Klan thought was another Klan member actually was an FBI informant opened fire and Viola Laiuzo was killed. That's what you will read if you read any account of Viola Laiuzo's life. Here's what you won't read, is that the next day two lawyers in Birmingham, Alabama looked at each other. They had gotten very, very wealthy, had gone to law school together, went to college together, and started a law practice together and were making a lot of money, mostly by defending Ku Klux Klan members who had committed violence against black people. All you needed to do at that time is find a white jury and present a little bit of evidence and no white jury is going to convict another white person of any crime against a black person. But they made a ton of money mostly doing that. These two lawyers looked at each other and said, you know what, we're on the wrong side of history in this thing. And those two lawyers changed the whole direction of their lives. One of those lawyers was named Morris Dees, who went on to found the Southern Poverty Law Center. <clears throat> I get emotional talking about this. The other lawyer was a Mildred Fuller, who went on to found Habitat for Humanity. And the transformation that takes place when we do the stuff that we're just supposed to do can be very powerful. Who knows? what backs we stand on when we go out and work to transform lives and transform communities. I'm grateful for the chance to do this. I find joy in it every day. Thank you. Thank you. My timer says 14 minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, but do you, are there any questions that any of you have before I sit down? Well, let me ask you. You know, I think what you say basically is that Habitat is not a handout, but it's literally a helping hand up. And I'm wondering how you could tell the public how they could volunteer if they wanted to, because we know that you have volunteers who come and help build the houses along with the families that are going to take ownership of them, as well as volunteers at the store and other places. Thank you. Yes, um, we're embarking on what I'm hoping to be 10 new homes in the next five years. It depends a lot on our whether or not we're successful in some funding and some land acquisition for that. Go to our website, Google um, Lycoming County Habitat for Humanity. We're probably the first, um, first uh, site that comes up. And look on a ways to get involved and you can sign up as a volunteer uh, with that. Our homeowners pay a mortgage on their house, and we, we hold a mortgage. It's filed with the county. It's a legally held mortgage, and also contribute 250 hours of working on their own home per adult. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone Appreciate else? Thank you. Appreciate you being here. <clears throat> okay, moving on to reports, uh, 2.1, 2.2, Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners, and happy birthday. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. I am here to um, present the personnel actions report for the month of March. Um, I'm not really sure if I spoke um, at this venue about uh, the change in process with this, but I just wanted to take a second to do that. Um, we used to, prior to me starting, report on personnel action changes every week, um, and that was a little cumbersome for our team um, and sometimes held up the process. So um, in efforts to get our employees started as quickly as possible to support the functions and mission of the county, um, we're going to start reporting on that on a monthly basis. And we have been doing that um, this year so far, but I wanted to take the time to explain that here in this venue. So I have the uh, monthly report for March here. Um, we had changes um, 
personnel actions um, for the chief assessor, director of tax claim bureau. Um, there's a couple corrections officers, a clerk position, a custodial worker, um, a maintenance position, two general accountants, a deputy director of HR, and a technology specialist. So I have um, this report sitting on the back table for anybody that would be interested in seeing it. Okay, thank you. Any questions? I have a motion. I'll move to approve the personal action for the month of March. I'll second. On the other side. Uh, you know, Jessica, I'm looking at it. Um, yes. Where is that personal action report? We were looking at the assessment. I think you and I were looking at the assessment. I don't believe we have a copy. No. Oh. I don't have a copy. So, um, I, I, yeah, I don't know what to say. Let me go. Let me go grab a couple. So one one thing I may see if we can do in HR is find the way that they presented it in the past. I think it was it was easy to follow because I think I looked at the January one. Um, thank you. Thank you. Let me just see here. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, anyway, I move to approve. We can talk about that. A second. Okay. And did the other Yeah. Alder's aye. 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 Great. Okay. Thank you. And we have. Uh, yep. So I also have um, a TDA action. Um, we are uh, doing some restructuring within our um, RMS department, and we are moving all of our support staff, the maintenance staff, under the support department. So. Uh, currently, uh, we have a recycling maintenance technician that's falling under the recycling department, and we are going to just move that position under the support department. So no changes in title, no changes in pay um, or status, simply just moving the position under a different department within RMS. Okay. Now motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. 2.3, Brandy, uh, Council Pamela. It's one pump off my pants. Oh. They're a little slippery and it doesn't want to stay on the day. That's about the fifth time it's come off. Um, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. I'm here to get ratification for the invoices due through April 13th, 2022 that were paid on April 6th. 2022. Um, the amount actually went down by $56.16. We found a duplicate invoice when we put the check run together. So the total was actually $1,493,297.47. It came out of the general fund total which ended up being $1,117,815.28, or approximately 75% of the check run this week. Uh, grants and other sources were $278,286.67, and RMS's total was $97,195.52 this week. Okay, any questions? So we got a lot out of the general fund this week. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'll move to it. I'll second. I'll be your side. Aye. Okay, thank you, Brandy. Thank you. This time we'll recess the Commissioner's Public Meeting for the Board of Assessments. We'll convene the Board of Assessments at this time. Brooke? Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. The first one is a real estate refund. I'm seeking your approval for a Joseph Grace. The land was split off in 2012, except for the residual of 4.26 acres, but the acreage was not changed to reflect that back in 2012. The refund amount is $1,002.77. Okay. I have a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Second. Aye. Aye. Yes, sir. Aye. All right. Security, thank you. The next item I'm seeking approval on is the list of real estate exonerations. These reflect back to the 2022 county billing. 
you should have that list in front of you. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any questions, comments? I do not. Commissioners? No, I think they were all pretty typical, right? Uh, Brooke? Yes, pretty much. It's just because our cutoff is in January for the county billing. So work piles up until I open the system back up. Then people get their bills and it may be a white tour that mobile home down last year or the veterans exemptions. People don't realize we need that letter showing that they're exempt. Right. Okay. Okay, go ahead, motion. I'll move to approve. A second. All clear side. Aye. 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 Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Commissioner. At this time, we will adjourn the Board of Assessments and reconvene the Commission's public meeting at this time. And we'll move on action items. 4.1, Chris Brewer will be voting to approve Ordinance 2022-01 uh, for incurring the non-electoral debt by the issuance of general obligation. Good morning, Chris. Commissioners, good morning to you. Good to see you all. The uh, document I have before you, the ordinance that our office prepared as bond council, is to authorize a set of bonds for refunding purposes. And I think the, um, the good news is, is that we are taking all the actions that are appropriate at a, in a good order and a good pace to prepare you once again for a refinancing opportunity. Uh, as you know, Joe Muscatello from Benning and Scattergood, your investment banker, is always monitoring this carefully. And you have two issues, the 2012 B series and the 2014 bonds that come up to a, what we call a call date, a redemption date, when you can call them in from investors later on this summer. So under federal law, we're allowed to get this transaction underway and with the hope and, and crossing our fingers that we might be able to get bonds issued as far in advance as 90 days of that call date, maximizing all the opportunities. So this ordinance would uh, put a few other steps in motion. As you know, you've already gone through some processes with the rating agency to get your credit reviewed. Uh, an official statement has been prepared and could go out to investors. This document, if you've adopted, will authorize the, uh, the debt, but the debt is just for refunding purposes, and it's only going to be uh, issued if you can achieve a $200,000 minimum savings. No, no extension of term, nothing else is to be achieved here other than trying to save the taxpayers money. And um, yet, if you take this action today, it lets us check the box for one more item in the process, but we will not be filing with Harrisburg and not selling bonds until we can see the market come around to where we want it to be. At the moment, we are chasing that market a bit. Uh, when we first started this, of course, rates were much more attractive at the very beginning of 2022 than they are at the very at this moment. But there is no fee from my firm, as your bond counsel, no fee from Benning and Scattergood until we can get to a point in time when we can see the market cooperate with us and get the goals and savings you want. Even if we get that 200000 the, the document, while it authorized the chair to sign a contract for selling the bonds, it's going to be a communication process. We're not going to want to do this until you all are comfortable that we've got the best we can hope to get. Um, so I wish I could tell you that rates were cooperating as they had been for so many years here of late. We've had such a great low interest rate market that we've enjoyed. Uh, my mom would say we're a bit spoiled, and um, she would be right about that on so many fronts for me. But um, she would say that, what? She, that, we're, that I'm spoiled. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that we're collectively spoiled. We've had such good interest okay. rates. Um, but again, all we're doing is trying to set you in place so that if opportunity presents itself, then we can take advantage of it. A wiser man than me said that good luck resides at the crossroads of opportunity and preparation. And so we're on the preparation side of the road right now. Yes, sir. This would not extend the, the uh, date at all. Yeah, we're not extending any debt. We're not <coughs> maneuvering any debt. We're just trying to get you lower interest rates if the market will afford those to us. And Chris, uh, I want to thank you for everything that you do for the county as well. Uh, Joe Muscatello has been there ever since I've been here and, and, and long before I was. Uh, these are individuals, as we do perform our duties uh, as county commissioners, we're not always looking at our bonds. We're not, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at providing services to our constituents and uh, the fiscal uh, fiduciary responsibility of, uh, to the taxpayers. Uh, what's amazing is that the opportunities that arise in refinancing and and this one would be one of our smaller opportunities but nonetheless if we can get that 
two hundred to four hundred thousand uh, dollars is something that we charge you and we have confidence in you to, to be notifying us and without fail uh, your company as well as Joe's been awesome. I appreciate that but the, the, the plaudits go around the whole the whole team we can we can point out things to you and advise you of things but you as commissioners your administration have always been looking ahead and keeping an eye on things as well and always quick to do the things that you need to do on this side of the table as well on your side of the table as well um, we do have some clients who yeah we're busy right now get back to me later and and that's not the proactivity that any of us need uh, you're right we have been able of late to do better with some of your transactions because they're larger sizes and a great market but that's not to say that every dollar isn't an important dollar so that's the goal here just so the public understands that um, you know the money that we've saved has always been net of fees so when Chris says that you know we're looking to save 204 200,000 to 400,000 that's after all the fees have been that's paid right. So it's pure cash, and and I think since I've been here, we've saved over a million dollars in refinancing. We had one, even even more than that. Uh, do you remember, Chris? Exactly. Oh, I don't have that number. We no, can, we but can. maybe a million and a half, which is which is, and we do appreciate both you and Joe and the work you do, as well as the Budget and Finance Office for staying on top of keeping our books in order, so that when we go to do this, we have everything that we need. You know, one of the things that came out of this. Rating. Go ahead. It's the rating, right? So the three of us, uh, along with Joe and Chris, get on a call, and Brandy from our budget and finance, who provides very, very important help to us in, in, in letting the uh, rating agency, which is Standard and Poor's, know where we stand in terms of how much debt we carry, what is our revenue like, what is our ability to raise taxes, uh, you know, et cetera. And um, we got a very good rating back. They look at the community, what's happening in the community. Is there job growth that's going to contribute to tax revenue coming in? Is there uh, population growth? We've had our struggles, and yet at the same time, uh, we got a very good rating in this last one. I think it was a double A, right? Um, well, you're going to qualify for bond insurance, which we're raising a double A. Right. It's an A plus underlying rating for the county. And, and to your point, and the reason that the pats on the back go around the whole group is, some of the statistics and, and information the rating agencies look at, you don't have a whole lot of control over. You right. are situated where you are in your community. Um, but it's the management and the proactivity and the preparation for troubles as much as you know, looking for the, for the good things that occur. Um, that's what helps to seal the deal with rating agencies. And so you guys score high on all that. Thank you very much. And I think that's a good point, uh, Commissioner. You talk about the ratings. Um, and I've been in a number of them now. Um, they always feel that, that we do a great job uh, in preparing for the, the rating. Uh, but they've said to us on a number of occasions, your population isn't there to increase your, your rating. And uh, we just had a chamber update. It's amazing the amount of companies that are looking to expand or come into Lycoming County. It, it, it's really great. It's great news. Um, and we could have over a thousand jobs coming into our area here in the next couple of years. But no matter how many jobs we can create, we need the population growth. And, and hopefully we can attract these newcomers into our community. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we talk to our, especially people that moved into our community, they love it. They, they think it's the, a, a great, quality of life and we have phenomenal people uh, people that will say hello to you on the streets and they're not a lot of people aren't used to that uh, so let's uh, let's keep pushing uh, for not only jobs but uh, to create a, an environment where we can we can get people moved into our community and increase those bond ratings Absolutely. and you know just a, a shout out to the families out there however the family is constituted we need all of us to recognize that we have to shape the workforce of tomorrow with the young kids today. And whether they're two years old or three years old, we have to start to pay attention to the things that are going to make them succeed in school, reading, reading to them when they're young. I hope every family out there, as difficult as it is, finds a way to read to a child at least 20 minutes a night, because that reading to them stimulates the brain and helps them learn to read. And that workforce, Commissioner, we hope people will move here, but 
we need to prepare that they don't and we have our own workers right that we have our own kids because there's dignity in people doing a job that has integrity as you said Beth challenge and purpose right and so hopefully we can uh, whether it's Habitat for Humanity or whatever we can do that so thank you Chris for helping us guide the way here with these bonds and we hope you can bring us many savings <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't guarantee anything but all I can do is to I get you prepared so. we'll be calling your mother if you don't <laughs> it's it's a long distance call okay thank you Chris thank you all. I'll move to approve the I'll second 2022 aye aye 4.2 through 4.6. Good morning, Commissioners. Morning. So the first item I have for you is but to approve agreement with Coachella Psychological Services. This is for forensic and psychological evaluation support. Um, it's going to amend the term and also increase the hourly compensation, but not the total overall compensation of $60,000. Okay, and this is a 2022 budget item and that motion. Is. I'll move to approve. A second. All in favor say aye. Aye. So carry. Take care, uh, Chris. Safe trip back. 4.3. It's vote to approve the master self agreement with timekeeping system. This is for technology improvements at the prison. Um, if you remember, this is part of the contract that we have with DSI ITI, which is for inmate phone services. And they're going to be um, incurring all the costs associated with this, so there's no cost to the county to implement these new technologies. Okay. No motion. I'll move to approve. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carry. The next item, 4.4, .4, is vote to approve the RFQ or request for quotes for UGI trenching services and award that to RML Development Company. And this is for the gas main extension project located at the landfill. Okay. Uh, it's also 2022 budget and item. I'll move to approve. A second. Oh. Up your side. Aye. 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 So period. On the next item, 4.5, it's vote to approve the Community Development Block Grant Program contract with Department of Community and Economic Development. This is our 2021 allocation and the amount of $607,465. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. And then my last item, 4.6, <coughs> is to award the invitation to bid for food products to Kiko Distributors, Caesars, and Cisco, and this is for the second quarter. Okay, and a motion. I'll move to approve. Now second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, Maya. All right, thank you very much, Commissioner. Yeah. Okay, moving on to 4.7. <coughs> Kristen McLaughlin, are you on the line? I am, Commissioner. Morning. Um, good morning. This is a resolution in regards to your ARPA funding for um, the revenue loss section of, of those ARPA fundings up to the amount of $10,000. Um, this is just simply million. allocating those funds towards that project. Kristen, did you mean $10 million? $10 million. I apologize. <laughs> There's a big difference there. Big <laughs> difference, yeah, 10 million. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any questions on this resolution? Here, I can have a motion. I'll move to approve. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 And then, Kristen, you heard about the, well, you just heard the vote on the CC, CDBG? I did. I did. Um, I'm glad that came in as fast as it did. Okay, good. And you know that we're having a meeting Tuesday at 6 o'clock with the agricultural community, although we certainly would welcome any member of the public who wants to come and uh, if the focus is on the, on the farming community for the ARP funds. But if you missed an earlier meeting and you want to come and learn about it, please, Tuesday, 6 o'clock in this room. We're talking about that. Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Commissioners. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. Brooke, mm -hmm. are you still on? Brooke. Good morning, again, Commissioners. I'm seeking approval for an agreement with Palmetto Postings. This agreement is for the posting of properties that will go up for tax sale in September 
We haven't had a agreement with them since 2013. This agreement would be until the end of December 31st, 2024, with the right to extend the contract up to two years. The cost of post is $25 per posting. That fee has not changed at all. And this is a 2022 budgeted item. Okay, great. I have a motion. I'll move to approve the I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Commissioner. 4.9. Pat? Good morning again. Good morning, um, this is a vote to approve the amendment to the agreement for MCM Consulting Group. This is for the radio project. Um, it says 2022 budget item, but there's no money attached. Um, it's simply the date was expiring, so we needed to extend it to the end of December of this year to complete the project. I like that motion. I'll move to approve. A second. Any questions for Beth? Hearing none. All favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, 4.10, Jerry Kennedy. That's the ground for Kate. <laughs> Morning, Commissioners. Uh, before you this morning is a contract with Melillo Consulting uh, to upgrade our email services uh, at uh, $19,343. This is a 2022 budgeted item. Okay. I have a motion. I'll move to approve. I'll second. Any questions for Jerry? Jerry, all good side. Aye. 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 Thank you, Jerry. Uh, yes, we, we have a, a meeting next Tuesday. Uh, first will be with the uh, early childhood regarding the ARPA funds, and that will be at 2.30. And uh, we've invited the early childhood uh, um, groups to join us to discuss the ARPA funds. And then that evening we'll be uh, entertaining the agriculture and uh, forestry uh, people throughout our county at 6 o'clock here in this room. Um, we hear their concerns and uh, things they've been experiencing over the last two, two and a half years, um, and how ways we could possibly help them to our plans. So we'll look forward to those meetings uh, with those individuals. Um, again, we invite anyone to attend those meetings, especially on the six o'clock one, that's open to the public. Um, they're welcome to join us too. And then uh, as spring, is taking place here you'll see that as you travel around the county you'll see the fire halls are having uh, fish dinners they're having many dinners throughout the community um, we encourage you they were hit very very hard through COVID and uh, they're trying to recoup a lot of their losses um, you know they're all are on shoestring budgets to start with so if you're out and about and you're you're hungry and you want to support your local fire company please stop by um, for their chicken barbecues, their fish dinners, and um, they have fantastic food. I've stopped at many of them, and you can't beat the price, you can't beat the food, and at the same time, you're helping out your local fire company. So we encourage you to also look at possibly doing that if you wish to. That's all I have. Commissioner Massar, Mayor Beadle. So um, I saw an article published in the Sun Gazette on April 1st entitled uh, Like Coming County Government Complies with Right to No Request. Uh, the article was about the meeting that was held on March 10th at which the commissioners voted to approve the reorganization of the Information Services Department. Here, you guys can take a copy if you want to follow along. So I was absent from the March 10th meeting due to an illness in my family and I didn't participate uh, in the meeting. Uh, the article reported that the Sun Gazette had filed a right to no request to find out the specific amounts that the commissioners had approved to pay each employee as a result of the reorganization. And then, first of all, though I didn't participate in the meeting, I will apologize to the Sun Gazette and to the public for the fact that a right to no request had to be filed uh, to obtain information that belongs to the public. Um, as the public may notice, about six weeks ago we changed the way that we, we report personnel changes and the salary changes in our agenda. And I want to explain how we arrived at this, at this juncture. Uh, the commissioners have been concerned, by the way, this is my statement, so I don't, but, but I speak collectively here because this is true. The commissioners have been concerned about morale issues with employees, uh, and in particular dissatisfaction with compensation. Uh, so the commissioners believe that some of the morale issues were driven by the publication each week 
of salaries and changes that resulted from reorganizations, promotions, or other changes in compensation. And after deliberation, we decided to terminate the publication of the wage and salary information each week. We agreed to continue to release at the end of each month a summary of personnel actions with wage and salary changes. And after observing the practice for six weeks, I've concluded that the practice is both ineffectual and not consistent with open, transparent government. Uh, the reason the practice is ineffectual is that employees still will speak with each other and speculate, speculate about the wage and salary changes. Indeed, the lack of specific information uh, simply feeds a rumor mill that has, uh, in my view, worse outcomes. And, and we've heard from other elected officials that there is this uh, speculation among employees. But more important than the morale issue however, issue, however, is the issue of depriving the public from information on a timely basis about how government officials spend their tax dollars. And I believe that we should not deny the intrinsic right of the public to know about expenditures of tax dollars in attempt to deal with an employee morale issue. Uh, the county's policy on information mirrors the state right to know law. The county has a policy that all information that's not exempt in some way is public information and should be made available to the public without the public having to file a right to know request. The right to know request is only a tool to protect government officials from allegations that not all information has been provided. So in other words, if you ask us today for the wage rates for some action we took and we make a mistake, you can't allege that we gave you wrong information. If you file a right to know request and as a result of that request we give you information and that information is correct, you then can allege that we have violated and withheld information. So it's a tool really to make sure that um, government officials are not called out. The right to know request should not be an antecedent action necessary to obtain public information. In other words, the public shouldn't have to jump through hoops to find out how government officials spend their tax dollars. Um, the fact that we publish the information at the end of the month, in my view, does not provide the public with timely, up-to-date information. And the absence of timely information is more likely to encourage the public to disengage from government. So if we take action today and you don't learn what the specifics of the action are for 30 days, you're more likely as a member of the public to disengage from being involved in having an opinion or expressing the opinion. Uh, and if I recall correctly, I, I'm the commissioner who made the motion in my first term to publish the monthly summary of personnel actions. And that's what Ms. Seagrave spoke about today. That motion was not to replace, and the action that we took in agreeing to do it, that wasn't to replace the practice that we had of providing the information on a weekly basis. It was simply to provide a summary in one place. So accordingly, I'm seeking to reach a consensus with my fellow commissioners that we return to the practice of publishing the wage and salary information each week when we vote on the <coughs> issue which gives rise to the change. This is the practice that we've utilized for at least the six years and I've been here and possibly longer, but Commissioner Messier can tell me if it's longer, for 10 years. I believe that the practice ha has served the public well and it fulfills our responsibility to have open, transparent government which empowers the public to hold elected officials accountable for their actions. So I look forward to a discussion about this with you all. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Appreciate your uh, opinion. Well, I'll tell you what. Do you, what are you guys prone to having a discussion about it? Because if you're not, I'll just make a motion to do it. It's not on the agenda one, but... Well, you don't need it to be on the agenda, but do you want to discuss well, it is what my question is. Well, we, we should have a discussion. We can. Okay, we have discussed it. You want, you're open to continuing the discussion. Yeah, I am. Okay, great. I think that's good. That's what I think. I, am. Yeah. I also want to state that, that you were aware of what was, what was taking place, as you have stated, and you agreed to it being once a month. That was, when you had agreed to that, now you want to go back. Yeah, no, what I'm telling you is that six weeks ago we had a com we, we've had multiple conversations about this issue over the last two years. Six weeks ago we had a conversation and 
there was a lot of passion exhibited by my two colleagues about the fact that you thought that we shouldn't. So I said, okay, I will try the way that you're suggesting, which is to leave it off. That was six weeks ago. And what I'm suggesting to you is that after looking at it for six weeks, and this is what I said in my statement, I've come to the conclusion that it doesn't work. That not only is it not giving the public the information, but it's actually not helping to solve the morale problem. And what I said privately to you all, and I'll say publicly, and I might have said it publicly, I'm not sure, is that, look, we are trying and we are working very hard to try to correct compensation inequities in the county. Uh, we have been having the personnel department review what people make relative to other fifth class counties and fourth class and sixth class counties. We've had them look at what they make relative to the private sector. We are having them look at what the job descriptions are today and how it differs <coughs> from what they actually do. <coughs> Excuse me, because some of the job descriptions were written 20 years ago. We are doing all these things. At the end of the day, if employees are dissatisfied with what they make, they either they can obviously ask for changes, but if we can't make the change, then at some point they have to just agree that this isn't the place for them to work or that uh, they will accept that. We don't want to drive employees away. That's not our point. But it is not fair to the public to withhold information from them because employees cannot reconcile what they're being paid with, with what their expectation is. I am committed as an elected official to work to make sure that employees are treated fairly and that we do what we have a responsibility to do in terms of examining compensation and conditions to make sure that they are fair and equitable. I also, as an elected official, have a responsibility to the public to provide the information to them. So to answer your question, yeah, I agreed six weeks ago to do that. And, it's, and, it, and that's why I made the statement today that I would love to work and see if we can't reach a consensus to go back to what we did for 10 years. I think, t has it been 10 years, Commissioner? Yeah. Six years. So okay, so it's been six years. Through our conversations, and compensation is, is top of the list, the, our, our, evaluation, our evaluation process is outdated. We have 56 policies that have not been updated since 1999, since June 24th, 1999, which, we have, which I have harped on since I took office. Uh, we came in, we talked about um, having a compensation study done. Uh, it, was, it was north of $300,000 that we have placed in our budget. I'm totally against spending that kind of money. I think we all are. Uh, we were going to go in that direction with a study. Uh, nothing was done. We have talked to department heads, um, looked at compensation with numerous departments that were having a hard time getting employees here, and uh, made adjustments as we saw fit. Uh, I reached out to Blair County, and they have done a recent study. They're a fifth class county. I provided both commissioners with that information and asked for a committee to be put together that we did that was very similar to what we did with the insurance uh, and our broker and our, and our uh, wellness center, where we had a committee of uh, county officials that were brought together for over a year. We looked at our, our um, insurance and our wellness center and, and made a decision collectively, which was a, a fantastic idea and was a fantastic fit. Um, nothing was done on that committee. So at that point, we hired a new HR director. She came in. She has been working on all these issues diligently with her staff. Um, she has brought to us great ideas. She has looked at fourth, fifth, sixth class counties, looked at the private sector, and bringing all that compensation together. At the same time, she had stressed to us that um, about the weekly situation that she explained today, uh, Commissioner Massar said according to the law, they have to be published once a year. Uh, we had that conversation. We decided we'd do it once a month. We're not trying to hide anything from the public. If the Sun Gazette would have had a question, she was welcome to come up to the bench that day and ask the salaries. We would have gave her the salaries. They chose to write an article, which is their right. We are not hiding anything from the public. Whether we go back to weekly or we stay a monthly, we will be transparent, we will be fair, and we will tell the taxpayers how the monies are being spent. This is an issue that, that is at everybody's front um, bumper regarding the compensation. 
employees want to be compensated fairly. We live in a different era now after COVID where employees are basically in charge, where they can um, go and choose where they want for jobs. The salaries are, are going up everywhere, but we only have so much to work with when it comes to taxpayers' dollars. We can't raise prices such as a business can to, to um, absorb that cost. We have to live within our means. We have to live within our budget. We will at any time answer questions that have to be answered. And we'll always be transparent. If, like I said, if we go back to weekly or we go to monthly, we're within the, the, the um, confines of the law. We're going to make sure that things are transparent. That is what's been taking place. This is an issue that we need to continue to work on. Our HR department's working on it. We will be transparent when it comes to spending the monies. But at the same time, we have to make sure that the monies are spent wisely and we have to live within our means. You know, one of the be things. Sound. Yeah, one of the things I think is great is that when I pick up the newspaper and read about the school board, I can see right then and there the school board voted to hire this person at this wage and hire this superintendent at this wage and this teacher, et cetera. And that's what we're talking about. We used to do that in our agenda so that when someone came and picked up the agenda, they could see that we hired um, the director. You know. and, and all in favor? I'm no, no, I'm not saying you're I'm not. With this I'm, I'm not saying you're not. I'm not yeah. saying you're not. I'm trying to explain why, why I think this is so important. And, and so as a taxpayer, I like that. That's why I'm hoping that we can continue to have dialogue on it. That's why I, I think this is a positive thing. We need to, we need to talk it, about this. It's important they are printed. It's taxpayers' yeah. money. Whether it's weekly or monthly, that's the issue. Yeah, and, and, and so part of the reason why um, I think that the uh, reading it in the paper at the time it happens with the school board or at the time it happens with the county commissioners or with city council or whatever is that it gives the constituent an opportunity to connect in action with what was done. I operate from the philosophy that if I can't explain why I voted for something with a good conscience, then I have no business voting for it. So I don't have a problem if we have to raise the 911 operators with various uh, bonuses or retention to attract them. And, and I, I don't have a problem if we have to pay a certain amount of money uh, because I feel that that's what we need to do. Um, I don't want to give too much empowerment to people to think that, you know, the employees have total control over what goes on because while we are having a hard time recruiting people, we never can just, you know, say that we're not able to find people. We need to become more creative and one of the great things that our personnel director is, is doing is putting together various tools for us to use, for when I say us, for the county to use in terms of recruiting, and she'll probably bring that up at a meeting next week, um, and ways to attract people. So um, I see this as a positive thing. It doesn't have to be something that we are calling each other out about. We try something, maybe it doesn't work the way we thought it was gonna work, it, and we try to change and move on. I mean, that's how you learn from mistakes and, and how we grow as, as elected officials. And that's where I'm coming from. And, and we, <coughs> across the state, we were just recently at CCAP. Every county's faced with this. The private sector's faced with this. Trying to locate employees at, at fair wages. Um, like I said, we have been working on this. Um, diligently, I've talked to numerous commissioners. Like I said, I gave you guys results from Blair County where they, what they did, their study did. I shared that with Jess. She's using a little bit of that as she moves forward. So any way we can bring this information together to work on this issue is, 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 is helpful. And I think all three of us were a little, you know, the EIP report, what Commissioner Metz is referring to is the EIP report three or four years ago said, listen, um, you know, you need to look at your compensation system. and. Uh, and we went out as a second phase of the EIP to possibly hire a consultant to do that, and, and we were all a little Too much money. shocked when we saw the price tag that it came back at. And that's why we've undertaken with HR to uh, uh, you know, try to do this in-house, in-house. And, and it's, been, it's been successful, and we have to just say to employees that we're continuing to get there. I guarantee you this, even after we go through all these changes, 
and we make all the adjustments and we raise pay and so forth, there are going to be some employees who are going to say, well, wait a second, that's not enough. And to that, that's where I'm, I'm suggesting to you that we can't decide how we drive the train because the, uh, some folks on the train are not happy with. We have to also remember that our employees are the most important asset, asset, asset we have in the county. Absolutely. And they need to be fairly compensated within our budget, within Absol our means. Absolutely. No, there's no question. And at the same time, we struggle to try to protect our taxpayers, which all three of us are doing. So, yep, absolutely. Anyway, um, I welcome an opportunity to continue to talk about this. I think we, we need to try to find a solution. Okay, thank you. You're anything welcome. else? Okay. Uh, anything from the public? <coughs> Please. Good to see you, Tom. Good to see you. Birthday yeah, that's what I understand. <laughs> I was going to bring a birthday card with me for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, what my wife told me when I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom Adams from Williams Court. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, once again, I don't know that people really, I don't know if I really appreciate the work that's done by our public people that work with public service. Because um, Talk about between a rock and a hard place, especially when it comes to compensation. We were just talking about and having that to the public. Which sometimes, maybe uh, you, you have the transparency, and, and the walls, you know, just my observation, the wall says once a year, maybe, maybe just do it twice a year. Um, it's not so much in the forefront of people's minds, but it still might be anyway. You know, it's, sort of, it's a tough situation. Um, but I was always taught, no matter what you're being paid, you work honestly, you work hard, and, and just give a full day's work for what you're, for no matter what you're hired for, what you're paid for. That's how America's, that's one of its founding principles. I mean, you just, you just do it, and uh, if a better opportunity comes along, you take it, but you don't take it begrudgingly, you don't, you don't disparage your former employer or, or anything like that, unless there were some real agree grievances, but... Um, it's honesty that, that has to carry us through, and honesty and integrity. I mean, it's once again. Um, so uh, it's easy to get brainwashed, though, isn't it? Where, where people think, kind of all of a sudden gets get some information, but it's when information is withheld, it's easy for people to get get lost and not really know which direction you're going. Case in point, you know. People think Supreme Courts of the state or the, or the country, they're supreme all the land or not. They're only supreme over the court system. And they have, they have certain jurisdictions, parameters that they're allowed to govern over. They're not allowed to, like we have here in, in the state, tell the Senate they can't conduct an investigation on the, on the voting machines. It, that's not the, in the jurisdiction of the court. That's not how, we should just have a house House of suggestions and, and you know, and then just let the court say, well, they can't do it. So why, why have a constitution? You know, that, so we've been really off the rails. But I really did want to mention that the physical therapy program you have. I think that's great. You know, that's one great thing for people because it's not the lack of drugs that gets people sick. It's lack of you know, exercise, proper diet, proper sleep, um, and. And along those lines, uh, there's a lot of evidence that vaccines in general just aren't the best thing for people. You know, it's if you look back at history, it's not act actually vaccination that probably brought healthier people. It's sanitation because the sewer systems, the sanit sanit sanitation, even of the hospitals, people live longer, um, and they decided. Uh, Back in the 1800s, they realized that you, you don't lead people to bring them to health. You, you, that's not how you do it. And and the sanitation in the, in the hospitals was horrendous until in the mid 1800s, some people started realizing you're going to be clean going from patient to patient. That's, that's why people are dying left and right in the hospitals. And, and so it's it's a lack of information that, that uh, is destructive. Um, so. I think guys do a great job, and anytime there's going to be some uh, people that 
don't agree with everything, it's trying to take it personally. You know, you just if you know you're doing the best you can and work honest, that's what all the world all need to do. Um, so I don't want to take up any more time. I think that's it. Uh, but it's goodness, you know. When America ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. I, I really see it sliding. Like that's what Alex the Buckwell told us, you know, after his visit to America. So places like Habitat for Humanity is really great. I to see we can see that continue to to uh, flourish. So, thank you. Thank you. And we'll look forward next week to hearing from North Central Saint Services oh, as they'll be joining us. Well, before we conclude, um, your colleagues, about your gig, Bloom, and uh, we want to thank you for the services that you provide our our county and the, and the leadership. Uh, thank you. You came aboard in probably one of the most difficult times this county has ever had, and I, and I mean that. I mean. Uh, you're looking at from the workforce to, to the exodus to people not wanting to work or come back to work uh, to, the, to the the pay scale. Um, it's been a, it's been an unbelievable two years. Mm -hmm. Not even quite two years. Mm -hmm. COVID and um, you you've shown you you have the leadership that that's needed, especially at the county level uh, to to carry us through, you know, from uh, you know, all the uh, COVID reports and uh, your prayers, uh, they're awesome. Uh, and uh, I can't say enough about you. And I think the whole board, uh, we agree, uh, uh, for the most part. We, we, we get along, uh, we know we have some difficult decisions, and uh, I think we're pretty much all on the same page. I believe I have you two laughing more than you've laughed in the last six years. Well, I'm sure that. <laughs> Commissioner Messer and I always laugh. I keep things in first step, but I appreciate the kind of words. I um, I have to give my, my faith in, in Christ um, as my foundation. Um, that's what gets me through every day. Family, my parents, I couldn't have had two better parents that instilled in me, treat people the way you want to be treated. And be kind to people and treat them fairly and uh, if you treat people fair and you're straightforward with them as my dad always was and the love my mom showed uh, they'll treat you the same way and I've always tried to treat people that way um, you know, we're not always going to agree I don't agree with people they're not going to agree with me that's okay I love to I don't have all the answers and none of us do but when we work together and share those ideas and we can do great things, and uh, as long as we have those open minds and are honest with each other, we'll get things accomplished. And that's why, you know, it's, to hear the chamber yesterday talk about what's going on in this county, and there's a potential for a thousand new jobs within the next few years here. And employers, employers are coming here, and they're they're looking at us, and they're looking at us. Well, not only not only just in the state. But over other states, um, you know, we have Digger who chose us over in North Carolina, and and uh, and he chose us because of, the, of when he came here and, and met the people, the people made the difference. They made the difference when he met those type of people. That he says that's what I have back in my home state. Good, hardworking, honest people. That's why I wanted my my manufacturing plant. You know, that's why we settle here. That's why we call this home. We can say hi to each other in the street and uh, truly care about each other. So thank you very much for the kind words. And uh, it's tough turning 39. I'm going to be losing. I was going to say <laughs> happy birthday. I know you're 40 years old. Uh, I'm going to be losing. I'm going to be leaving my 30s here. And, yeah. So, but uh, it's all great. It only gets better. That's right. And uh, I've been truly blessed. A wonderful family. A wonderful wife, kids, grandkids. Truly, grandkids are the best. They truly are. <laughs> and so thank you to everybody. Thank you for all the employees out there for what you do each day. Uh, you make the county great, not us. You make the county great for what you do each day for your constituents. And uh, I'll, I'll keep thanking you until the day I die.
So thank you on that. Our meetings adjourned. Have a great, uh, great week, and we'll see you next Thursday. Stick around for cake. We were like to have cake. Larry, cake. <laughs> up, up in our room now. I don't have any yeah. cakes here. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes silence is golden.